I have a very special guest today. Dr. Lori Kozier is, you may know her as Healthy Dog Workshop, she, and she also runs the Healthy Dog Expo, which is like the premier event on the East Coast of the United States for learning new things every single year from really incredible speakers, veterinarians, other professionals in the field. And she has agreed to come on and talk to you guys about drum roll, drum roll, titer testing. This has just been such, honestly, there are a few topics on social media that people just go freaking bonkers over, but lately titer testing has been one of them. I, and I think, I think it's that people just don't understand it. They don't understand what it actually is because I, a lot of the comments I get are, you know, you're just, you're going to kill animals basically because they're not being vaccinated against anything. And I'm like, that's not the point. You don't understand what I'm talking about. So Dr. Kozier agreed to come on and we're just going to talk all about it, all about titers and what it is, how we actually get to the point where we can do a titer test, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to ruin it. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Kozier. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is one of my favorite topics and one of the most misunderstood ones. So the chance to clarify is much appreciated. And please, guys, if you find this information useful, share it every place you can. Because titers uh, are often used incorrectly, interpreted incorrectly, and done more often than necessary. And all you're doing is wasting your money. So yeah. let's, let's fix that. Right. So I think... I've been, I've been doing this thing lately where I'm just, let's start at the start, right? And mm -hmm. we we can't get to a tighter test without first talking about well, what do we do with our puppies and kittens? How does it well, all start out? Well, it starts out in a variety of ways for a variety of people. But, you know, at the simplest, and, you know, we don't have the entire day to go into all the different uh, protocols. But it starts with a basic distemper, parvo, minimal number of antigens combination. And to back up, an antigen is something that stimulates an immune response to the body. So a distemper antigen, in the case of most of our distemper vaccines, is a weakened or modified version of the virus. So when it's introduced into the body, the body thinks, oh my God, it's distemper, let's make some antibodies. Fortunately, that particular vaccine virus does not cause disease, but it acts just like the disease. So I start vaccinating puppies a little bit later than most. I like to start at 10 weeks. And in the links, we should be able to put a link to the Healthy Dog Workshop site where you can get my vaccination protocol downloadable PDF. Um, I will be doing the 2024 version. This is the 2023. It'll be substantially the same. So grab that when you can, when you have time. Uh, uh, it's never, a, never without a dog. Um, one vaccine is given at a time. And typically most puppies will receive two vaccines separated by three to four weeks. Many veterinarians still believe it's necessary to do three, which to me is off label. The vaccine manufacturer has proven efficacy with two doses and totally unnecessary. Um, so two doses. And then if we choose to, four weeks after that, we can run a titer. And that what we're proving with that titer is the vaccine did its job and stimulated the body to make antibodies. Um, many people think a vaccine is a gift of immunity. It's actually a stimulation for immunity. So vaccination, strictly speaking, is the act of administering a vaccine to a human or an animal. Immunization is the actual acquisition or development of immunity by that individual animal or um, human. And that's a really important distinction to make because something like 5% of dogs will fail to respond to a vaccine properly. And that's huge. When I first started practicing, uh, we had we were in the middle of a big parvo surge 
And we found breeds such as Rottweilers, Pitbulls, Dobermans that did not seem to respond well to a Parvo vaccine. And when I say respond well, I mean produce protective immunity. So by science, we should have been testing all those dogs four weeks after their last puppy shot to prove that they worked. And if it didn't, to administer usually a different product to stimulate immunity. Okay. So it makes sense. It yeah, absolutely. And and that is so very different from what the average pet parent experiences in mm -hmm. a traditional you know, United States, we're, we're in the U.S., so the, right. the traditional veterinary clinic here in the U.S., you'll go in and you'll get a multitude of vaccines for your pet all at one time. And they say, come back in, I don't know, whatever it is. It's been so long since I've had a puppy or a kitten right. a couple of right. weeks. And then they do it all over again. And yeah. they're like, all right. And, and then a year goes by and they're, and they're like, okay, you need to come back because they're due for for updated vaccines. Mm -hmm. And that's just that from what that's I'm understanding, not true. Not true. It's not science. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, we who practice complementary, alternative, integrated, holistic, whatever you want to call it, non traditional veterinary medicine, we get labeled quacks and weirdos and we don't do anything based on science. But really at the core, we're all about the science. You know, every dog should have a titer because 5% of dogs don't respond. That means those are the dogs in danger. And they need to be identified and steps taken to provide them with immunity. Because sadly, we do still have parvovirus around here. In some areas of the country, we do have distemper. Um, but the good news is when, these, when the animal responds well, they can produce immunity to distemper and parvovirus that lasts nine to 15 years, which is essentially their lifetime with one or two doses in their lifetime. That's pretty incredible. And Isn't so it, I know, and, and not at that, all. That, we're really blowing your mind. that <laughs> piece of information was published by Dr. Ron Schultz in the Journal of Microbiology, I believe, in 1998. We've known this since 1998, and in 2024, there are still veterinarians out there giving a yearly DAPP, distemper adeno parainfluenza parvovirus, combination to dogs every year. <laughs> oh, good. There, there are mine. I'm sure everyone who's listening and watching understands. They, they absolutely understand. <laughs> And I try to cut out as much of it as I can, but, um, yeah. so, okay. You've talked about, you've already given us so much information, but we, we have more to cover and oh, we will definitely touch on, cause we haven't even mentioned the R word yet, which people oh, go right. yeah. bananas when we start talking about rabies. Um, so as few as possible at one time. So, I mean, preferably just one. one at yeah, a time. And when I say one, um, one would apply to rabies or if you were doing Lyme or something. The distemper parvo comes generally as a combo. And I just do the minimalistic combo. You can get DAP or you can get DAPP pretty easily. Um, in certain breeds, in certain situations, I will start with Parvo as a single antigen vaccine because truthfully, when it comes down to what am I worried about with puppies, it's Parvovirus, mm -hmm. you know, full stop. And giving the body just one thing to work on at a time, you're more likely to get a great response than if you, as some of my colleagues do, use the five-way combination or the seven-way distemper combination. And then they give a Bordetella and maybe a rabies if the puppy is older at the same time. That's complete overwhelm. You know, that's, that's like us at the holidays with 40 people coming over, trying to get everything done. Whereas if it was one person coming over, a piece of cake. Right. You know, for, for prep and stuff. So be careful what you load the body up with. So, yeah, so we're, we're attempting to not overload the body, not give the immune system too much to have to work on at one time because 
mm-hmm. I mean, they're still at that age. They're they're developing they're still and you, growing and everything. Right. And you said you recommend or you like to wait a little bit later than most, and and that would be around right. ten weeks. Yeah. Is is that because of the uh, immune system like passed down from the mother? I don't know exactly what that terminology so, is. Yes, you're on the right track. Exactly. So uh, when a puppy is born, the first milk that the mother produces in the first 24 hours actually contains antibodies. And it will have, there will be parvovirus antibodies and distemper and whatever else mom has been exposed to. Those antibodies will start to break down over time. And typically they are going to be broken down maybe by eight weeks, maybe by 10. Some in some dogs, they're still present at 14 weeks of age. Now there is a very elegant way using science to predict when those antibodies are going to be at a low level because those antibodies will just attack the vaccine virus and you'll get the immune system of the puppy will never see the antigen. So that's called a nomograph. And what you do either in the last two weeks of pregnancy or just after the puppies are born is you titer mom and you send it to Dr. Lori Larson, who's one of my Healthy Dog Expo speakers. She took over Dr. Ron Schultz's lab at Wisconsin when he retired. So there is nobody more qualified to comment on proper use of vaccines and immunology than Lori. And she has, they have a predictive chart and they will show you where mom's antibodies are down to the point where they will not interfere with successful vaccination. And that can, that can vary greatly. So if you have a preservation breeder, a responsible breeder, they're going to do a nomograph on mom and say, this is when we vaccinate the dogs. Uh, If you wait till 10 weeks, you're going to catch most of those dogs, those puppies. So if you don't have access to a nomograph, keep the puppy in safe places, wait till they're a little bit older. I am completely against the practice of vaccinating six week old puppies because basically it's just a waste. It's a false sense of security. And you're actually harming the puppy's immunity, uh, whether the vaccine label says you can do it or not. And many of my colleagues will vaccinate six-week-old puppies. And I think it's just not the best medicine that we can practice. So knowing all of this in advance, preparing for that first visit with your veterinarian, especially Mm -hmm. if this is new information that you're bringing to your veterinarian, Mm -hmm. Having all of this prepared ahead of time, and, and in fact, talking with your veterinarian prior to the appointment could be very yeah. beneficial so that they could actually, if they don't already carry these mm-hmm. single antigen yeah. vaccine, they can order them, correct? Like that would well, be the it, idea? That, that in a perfect world, yes. Yeah. Uh, in reality, that generally doesn't happen. Uh, Number one, the vet is, and we're all slammed right now, the vet is too busy to get on the phone in advance of the appointment. And depending on their beliefs, their practice, and their level of interest, they're not going to go buy a tray of 50 vaccines when they're going to use one of them. So Mm -hmm. I think the best bet is to find an integrative or holistic vet and, you know, request what you're coming in for. you know, I want a parvo only or a DAP is fine. And I don't, I don't have a problem with a DAP. Some, some veterinarians use distributors that don't carry them and they're not going to do a hunt for it. But when you go in there, regardless, if it's not going the way you want, and if they whip out and ask to see the label, if they whip out a seven way combination for your eight week old puppy, say, whoa, stop. No, thank you. I will. I will will do the physical and I'll find the vaccine that I want, the more limited version, you know, some other way. Um, Obviously, we want to be respectful. We want to be kind. The goal is to get more veterinarians to be interested and have access to the information. And Mm -hmm. speaking for myself, as well as other veterinarians, if you piss us off, we dig our heels in and you get nowhere because we tend to be strong-minded 
sometimes opinionated people. And if you offend us, you get nothing. So better to be polite, respectful, you know, explain. Some veterinarians really hate it when it's my breeder says, as a vet who works with a lot of breeders, a lot of times the breeder knows what they're talking about. And, you know, veterinarians, some veterinarians cannot recognize that. So just be nice, but don't be afraid to say no. Yeah. And I think we should maybe talk about that a little bit more in a little while as well. But what about, since we're already on this subject and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the tighter testing, but what about thimerosal free vaccines? Is that also something you recommend? Uh, that's what I use exclusively. Okay. So um, thimerosal is another name for mercury. Uh, you'll find it in rabies vaccines. You don't generally find it in other vaccines. Okay. So we're generally talking about rabies. A thimerosal free vaccine is more expensive. Mm-hmm. So many practices do not carry it. And I have people who drive to me near Albany, New York, from Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, just to chase down a mercury-free vaccine. It's like, hey, no problem. I can do that for you. Uh, I think it is beneficial because vaccines and human vaccines contain mercury as well as other things. You know, they tell us you shouldn't have this much in your body. And when you figure that that first rabies vaccine, regardless of what it is, is going to be considered a one year, and then you're going to repeat it every three years to stay in compliance with state laws, it becomes a lot of mercury. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do, I do like that. Um, we use a specifically a product called Imrab 3 TF. Uh, there may be one other company that makes it, but usually they'll put the TF, meaning thimerosal free right in the name. Um, okay. So, and that, so it's mercury that we're trying to avoid and, yeah. and all of this, um, it, there's a, there's an issue, not just with, and I think this is probably a good segue into why we're talking about this in the first place. Why mm-hmm. veterinarians like you and pet parents like me care mm-hmm. so much and want more people to understand what titer testing is and why we advocate for um, an alternative vaccine schedule. Because there's this thing that my understanding, a lot of traditional veterinarians don't even acknowledge to be a real, but we know it and call it vaccinosis. Mm -hmm. which is kind of a very broad term for a lot of things that could be going on in the body as it relates to um, symptoms of some um, negative effects that could be going on in the body. Is that correct? Yeah, we'll call it vaccinosis. The conventional veterinarian may just refer to it as a vaccine reaction. And most of the vaccine reactions that conventional vets will call occur within the first 24 hours of vaccination. And it could be something as simple as swelling at the injection site. It could be facial hives. It could be weakness, lethargy, vague, nonspecific signs, all the way to death. But generally speaking, if it doesn't occur in the first day of the same day as vaccination or same 24 hours, a lot of conventional vets will say it's not a reaction. Um, we in the holistic community disagree because we know the immune system is working on that vaccine for several weeks and that it can take time for the, the adverse reaction to manifest itself. Um, I personally have had both extremes. Uh, I had a patient at a clinic that I worked at about a four month old lab mix rescue puppy that came in, uh, for a distemper parvo. And um, I was happened to be giving the identical vaccine that the pup had received four weeks ago. So, you know, everything was going according to plan. Um, and I had the, in the medical record that came with the rescue puppy, they had affixed the label from the vaccine. So I had the serial number, the lot number, the whole nine yards. So rescue group did their job. I gave the same thing. 
and the dog went into a seizure before I could get the needle out of the dog's skin. And this is just a four-month-old puppy. All that puppy had had before was one dose of this particular distemper parvo vaccine. So it was totally done the way I would have done it if I'd been involved from the start. And, you know, that was like at 9.15 on a Saturday morning, and that puppy was dead by 2 o'clock. Despite being on IV fluids, steroids, I mean, intensive care. I worked on that puppy all morning. And that's how severe a vaccine reaction can be. And that is a classic type, I believe it's type four uh, reaction. Now, I mean, tragic, unpredictable. And like I said, the same thing would have happened to me if I had been in charge of that dog's health right from the start. Um, no way to predict it. Nothing. It was it was horrible. Of course, the the owner brought their child in. I mean, it was a full blown Technicolor nightmare. Um, the other type of vaccine reaction that I have personally experienced was with my own dog, who happened to be an Aussie, because you guys know I have Aussies. And I came home from the store running errands and found a bat in my house. So there's a bat flying around in my house. And my dog is a puppy. So, and I was kind of waiting a little bit to do his rabies vaccine. He had not had one yet. So he was probably about six months old at that point in time, coming to six months old, which was when I planned to do it. And so the first thing I did was go to my refrigerator, get a vaccine and vaccinate my puppy. So at least I could say, yes, my puppy is vaccinated even if it was an hour before there was any potential contact with the bat. And then I'm shuttling the dogs into another part of the house, chasing the bat for an hour, getting the bat out of the house. It was an ordeal. And everything looked fine. And I'm breathing a sigh of relief, pouring a glass of wine. You know, I'm, it was, it was probably like in August because I remember it being very, very hot and humid. And it's like the air conditioning isn't cutting it. It's vivid. Um, and about a month or so later, my dog started with intractable diarrhea. Now, my dogs are carefully managed, minimal drugs, minimal vaccines, raw fed, um, you know, doing things to the best of the way I know how. And it didn't matter what treatment I applied. The diarrhea just kept getting worse. Um, he became even more so mentally deranged, if you will. He could not focus. He was scared of his own shadow, which he had a tendency toward being, but it was amplified. And it got to a point, no matter what I fed him, I couldn't keep weight on him because he was having watery diarrhea. He was an Aussie with a very full coat. And, you know, two or three times a day, I have him in the utility sink, sink rinsing off the diarrhea from his furry pants. So. I tried drugs, I tried herbs, I even fed kibble. Nothing made a difference. And finally, I reached out to Dr. Larry Bernstein, who's a renowned veterinary homeopath and a past president of the American Veterinary Homeopathic Society or whatever the national organization is. And he, we talked for a, a lengthy time describing everything. He prescribed a remedy, take two pills of this in eight ounces of distilled water, shake it this many times, then take a teaspoon of that, put it in another eight ounces of distilled water. And at this point, even with my alternative viewpoint, I'm thinking this guy is out there, <laughs> just out there. How in the world could this do anything? Uh, so, and then he said, give, give your dog two teaspoons full. Let me know what happens. I thought, well, that was the quickest few hundred dollars gone. Uh, so I did that. And about five minutes after it happened, I was sitting at my computer, get finding my journal and, you know, cause I'm going to record everything. And I look over at my puppy and he looks at me and he takes this giant sigh and he literally collapsed in a heap and fell asleep. Now I hadn't seen this dog sleep in months and yeah. And I was like, what the heck just happened? And he, he just slept for an hour or two. And this is in the afternoon. And, you know, I, I repeated that again per Larry's instructions. And two days later, the diarrhea stopped. Wow. And, yeah. So 
And that's a that's a long story, but uh, I tell it for two reasons. Number one, no, you know, no matter what you're, if you're doing stuff to the best of your ability and stuff happens, it's not your fault. And I work with a lot of owners who feel guilty that they've done something wrong. They haven't in general. It's just, this is what happened. And this story explains why I am not a person who routinely detoxes dogs after vaccinations or automatically administers, you know, this homeopathic for this vaccine. Because as Larry explained to me, that's not how you use classical homeopathy. And the remedy we gave Pi was not one of the classic, you know, give it Thuya or give it Listen or give it this. Not one of the classic um, anti-vaccinosis vaccine reaction homeopathic remedies. Homeopathy should be best tailored to the individual dog and what's going on at that point in time. So there you have it. Yeah, and I, you know, not to throw too many stories at once, but I think it is important to understand that these things are so much more common than most people realize. Because I, I have multiple. I mean, I've I've had a lot of animals in my life, and um, I mean, I have had from what you said, I have had a cat who immediately, by the time I got home from the veterinarian, she was so lethargic. I was scared and going to the ER vet, you know, that evening yeah. because she was so lethargic and um, kind of s- just a general swelling overall of the body, like, mm-hmm. like almost like an actual, like you eat something that you're allergic to. I'm having yeah. like anaphylactic, you know, like there's just this swelling and she was so hot and so lethargic. And mm-hmm. I've also had, um, it was actually my husband's chihuahua when I, when I met him she had a little patch, a little like round spot on her, her mm-hmm. hind leg where she was missing fur. And as she got older, a um, you could feel the like tumor growing inside sure. of her leg through her abdomen. And you, you, like, you mm-hmm. could actually feel it and trace it through her body. And it was yeah. just from that yeah. injection site. So yeah. it isn't just what happens in the first 24 hours, like you were saying, there are so yes, many things that can happen. Slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then those, the GI issues, like you were saying, I, I've heard Dr. Will Falconer talk a lot about um, giving it a good 30 days because those mm-hmm. GI symptoms are absolutely <laughs> related to the, the vaccine yeah. if it's happening in that yeah you know, period of time generally. Um, very, very interesting and sad and mm-hmm. misunderstood by so many people. Correct. So I appreciate the insight into that. So um, just to kind of bring this back around, a titer test is you have administered the vaccines, hopefully the appropriate ones in the appropriate timing that you've already talked about. Right. And then right. we can wait. What is, what is your period about, of time? That you generally about, like four weeks. about four weeks. And then a titer test is just a simple blood test to measure Correct. if those vaccines, if the, the immune system in the, the, the body's immune system did what it was supposed to do with those vaccines and created an immune response. Is that how I'm understanding it? Right. So when you give that vaccine, you're stimulating the immune system in two ways. First, to produce antibodies, which are the um, types of T cells that directly attack invading disease-causing organisms of whatever type, they're, whatever the antibody is against. So we'll use parvo as an example. We produce parvo antibodies. If the dog encounters parvovirus, those antibodies jump on it, neutralize it, the parvovirus never takes a hold and causes disease. The other cell that is produced, which is what most people forget about, is the memory cell. And the memory cell is a lymphocyte that retains, if you will, the roadmap or blueprint of how to make antibodies. So over time, you know, let's say we vaccinated our puppy, we proved that antibody production occurred. Therefore, we proved that memory cell production occurred. 
maybe we titer that dog at 12 years of age and we see that the antibody level against parvo is very low. The conventional vet will say, oh, there's no antibodies there. We've got to vaccinate the dog. That is completely and totally incorrect, in my opinion, and Dr. Schultz's and Dr. Dodd's and various others, because we know of that previous titer where the antibody level was high enough that we could definitively say, yes, immunization occurred, memory cell production occurred. If this 12-year-old dog comes in contact with Parvo, the memory cells will activate because they're persistent for life. Antibody will be produced. The dog will be protected. That's also why I discourage people from repetitively titering their dog, because if the body is not exposed to a particular disease, it's biologically wasteful to keep churning out antibodies to that disease. So those antibody levels will decline over time. And if you don't understand the concept of memory cells, you're going to administer an unnecessary vaccine, as well as wasting your money, because you already proved immunocompetence. And that's really, if you remember nothing else, a titer proves immune system competence. And once you've proved it, you've proved it, you're done. And so is that what, when we hear duration of immunity, that's what that's referring to the memory cells. In many cases, the the term duration of immunity really is like how far out have we tested it? So, in that 1998 study that Dr. Schultz published, the DOI or duration of immunity was nine to 15 years. And you can test immunity in two ways: you can do a titer and demonstrate an antibody level, or you can do what's called challenge, which is exposing the animal to the disease. So, you know, we take that 12-year-old dog and we put some poop in there in their space that's contaminated with parvovirus. We have exposure. The dog gets sick. He's not protected. The dog doesn't get sick. He is. But, and, you know, and different studies will prove it in different ways. Now, the vaccine companies will do a duration of immunity study for one year which is why you, your distemper parvos are mostly labeled. It'll say administer yearly or administer every one year. Um, the rabies, you'll have one year and three year versions. Um, for a vaccine company to do a DOI study to FDA standards for like the rabies challenge fund, a five year duration of immunity, it's incredibly expensive. And then they have to turn around and pass that cost on to the consumer. So, you know, are you going to pay $200 for a rabies vaccine that's guaranteed to last five years? Probably not if you're the average consumer. I mean, you and I might, but the guy who's, you know, at home, has a beagle, feeds it pedigree, you know, that's not his jam. So he's going to say, no, give me, give me the, the one at the clinic where I can get it for five bucks. And it's going to be, you know, either a one year or a three year. And that that bringing up the topic of of cost, I I know in talking to some of my past veterinarians, specifically my last veterinarian in in San Diego before I moved to Texas, um, I had a good relationship with her, so I could just ask her things like a, a human. Because yeah. I mean, you're just because you're a veterinarian doesn't mean you're not a human, right? Like they can just talk to each other. <laughs> um, and. I'm like, why, why don't you offer titer testing? Like why, when I'm in the off in, in the space next to you and I'm hearing you talk to another client, like, why are you just, here's a, here's a vet. Cause she was a traditional vet, but sure. she was open enough to work with me and talk to me and, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it, it worked yeah. out. That's, and, that's a gem. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. but you know, why wouldn't you offer it? And she's like, people don't want to pay for it. And I'm like, but have you yeah. offered it to act, to find that out? And it's just like, maybe, maybe some veterinarians yeah. have, she was a relatively new veterinarian yeah. to practice. So I'm like, yeah. is this just a but I, but I completely agree with her, you know, yeah. uh, and many vets, many vets don't know about titers. They don't want to be bothered. So they price them high. They don't know where to send them. So they send them to the regular lab. The regular lab turns around and sends them somewhere else. And there's a charge for that, and they become hundreds of dollars. 
newsflash, a distemper parvotiter should not cost hundreds of dollars. And it should be done to an endpoint, which you're going to find at Kansas State University. And Kansas State University, I think I, I don't know, what do I charge for a distemper parvotiter? I don't know, $75, $85. So it should not be expensive. Um, you know, if you're sending it to Antec, they're just doing the VaxaCheck kit, which is not something I would choose because it's based on looking at the color of a blue dot and deciding if it's deeper blue than the control or less. So KSU, baby, that's where you yeah. want to send it. Yeah, I know um, that's where... They do not, they, Kansas does not work with the public. They only work with veterinarians. Uh, you can send to Dr. Jean Dodds. She will take submissions at Hemopet, Hemolife from owners. So you can do that. You just have to uh, pay your veterinarian to collect the blood and spin it for you, which is, you know, there should be a charge for that. You're mm -hmm. taking yeah. up. To yeah, you know, that's that. actually what I do. Yeah. Um, um, I've had people say the vet wanted $400 for titers. And unless you're talking about an export rabies titer, which has to be done you know, and st signed off by the federal vet. And it, yeah, that is going to cost 400 bucks. It should not be that much. But Definitely. there are, are alternatives. So like you were saying, there have your veterinarian, yeah, have your veterinarian do the blood draw and spin and you can and pay. You send, yeah. Yeah. Hemopet to, because I think if I remember correctly, I did the distempo and parvo and the rabies through Hemopet. And so I think she did the distempo and parvo like, in house at Hemo she, Pet, and then sent um, the rabies to Kansas State. If I rem if I remember, I don't I don't recall if she's doing her own or or sending both. But Got you it. know, it's it's done to an endpoint that I do know, um, and you know, I fully support her work and love sending people to her lab because part of she does she does mark it up, but part of that money goes back into the lab and benefits us all. Right. So, yeah. to, it's, you know, it's not the time to cheap out on stuff that's going to benefit us in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do, I do hear, you know, it's, it's like two things veterinarians don't like to talk about titers and your dog is fat because <laughs> you tell owners that, and then the, the next office call happens and you tell owners that, and you know, you're getting backlash. And after a while, it gets old. And I, I completely understand, you know, that's too expensive. That's too expensive. I'm not interested. Just give them the shot. And you get beat down and you're not going to offer it. Yeah, I see that happen more often than not, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad there are other services. Yeah. The most pushback I see is, is with the rabies vaccine and not for nothing, right? Because rabies is horrible. Like nobody wants to see a resurgence of rabies. Like that's, it's yeah. a horrible disease. Rabies, it's a horrible way to die. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the sticky part is it is legally mandated everywhere, you know, go worldwide um, because a, it's, it's a horrible disease and, the animal can spread it to humans and then the humans die. Uh, the trouble is the law saying, you know, we must give it every three years or what have you has not kept pet pace with the science. And we know from Dr. Dodd's rabies challenge fund that they tested two rabies vaccines, I believe two different ones. And they got a five to six year demonstrated protective level of antibodies. Because rabies is unique in that there is an internationally agreed upon minimum level of antibodies, and largely that's for international travel to countries that don't have rabies. They don't want to take any chances. So it used to be if you were going to import a dog to England, which is rabies-free, um, they would quarantine it for six months. Um, now, you know, if you've got vaccination dates that jive with their schedule and you have a tighter you're fine. Um, actually, I don't even think England requires a titer anymore. Japan still does. Um, but yeah, rabies is tough. And rabies is one of our more reactive vaccines. And you have the mercury <laughs> issue. So what do you, 
what is your general recommendation for the rabies vaccine? And if people don't want to continue to give it? Yeah. Well, number one, I'm not the rabies police. (laughs) So, you know, you, all I can tell you as your veterinarian is rabies is a legally mandated vaccine and you are responsible for following your state, county, whatever the jurisdiction is. You're responsible for following the law. I'm not enforcement. So, you know, I give you the information. I document that I gave you the information. Do with it what you may. Uh, I really wish they would accept the science that a titer is equivalent to demonstrating protection. Because truthfully, if you recall when we started, the difference between vaccination and immunization. So me just sticking your dog with a rabies vaccine does not guarantee a response. So really, a titer should be done. Um, If you choose to not vaccinate and your dog comes in contact with a wild animal, bites a kid, you know, your whatever the jurisdiction health department is going to get involved. Mm -hmm. And then your dog's fate may be in the hands of someone with much less education on the science than you have. And they can order quarantines. They can order the destruction of your dog. So it is a serious thing. Um, I do believe having personally seen two rabid animals, both uh, one raccoon, one skunk, um, both at a friend's house that's like two miles from my house. Um, And the skunk actually crawled through a chain link kennel and attacked two puppies that were in there that um, were not vaccinated. And one of the puppies went towards the skunk and was bitten all over. Uh, The other puppy, and my friend happened to be in her kitchen watching this happen and rushing out. The other puppy uh, was plastered against the wall and never came in contact. So we had to euthanize the first puppy because he'd been bitten. I mean, there was no two ways about it. And the other puppy we elected to quarantine. He was quarantined for six months. Um, He was fine. And again, my friend had seen what puppy did what. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to wildlife and, and these raccoons and skunks are in the cities as well. So I do believe every dog, if it's safe, should have a rabies vaccine, at least one on board. Because then you're talking about a dog that is overdue, not not vaccinated. And there's a huge distinction with that amongst health departments. I remember talking with Dr. Uh, Schultz years ago when we did the first fundraiser for the Rabies Challenge Fund. And he said, you know, in that scenario, if he had a dog that had received a rabies vaccine and then had an exposure, the first thing that should be done is that dog should be re-vaccinated. Don't wait. Don't care if there's gaping open wounds. Re-vaccinate it. Because he said he would bet on that vaccine to protect that dog every time, given that there was a prior vaccine given. And I thought, you know, that's that kind of goes contrary um, because the dog is not in perfect health. The dog has wounds. We know there's going to be infection. But that's the time that you you make that choice and say, no, we have to boost her. Yes, because that's where my mind went first to like, okay, but the dog's not well, which is the next question I was going to ask you. But right. at the same time, working them. You've th- got having- you the luxury of time to wait. Right. And, and of humans, like when that exposure happened at my friend's place, you know, I had to get reboosted. I've been vaccinated against rabies. God, I don't know how many times. Um, and she and her niece who lived with her had to get vaccinated because they had all, we'd all handled the dogs. And I remember getting the second booster after that exposure. I was so sick. So, I mean, I bet you, I bet you I've had 10 rabies vaccines in my life, mainly because of exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do, t- and here's, here's another talking point. If I want to get revaccinated for rabies, I have to get titered per- first to prove I need it. Now think about that and the parallel that it's not good enough, a good enough evaluation for your dog. It's good enough for me 
even post exposure, they can titer me rather than just boostering me. You mm -hmm. know, like, and they would do that if I had a more casual exposure than I had. Um, right. But good enough for a human, not good enough for a dog. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> doesn't make any sense, but it's a case of the the uh, dog's vaccination is legally mandated. The mm -hmm. human's vaccination is at the discretion of the health department. So right. it's a different state. Yeah. Where our laws are overtaking science, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, like you, you just brought up an animal that was not well. That was actually going mm -hmm. to be my next question because that is a big point of contention, I think, in the health healthy pet space is mm -hmm. that vaccines on the label say that they are designed for healthy animals. Yeah, um, administered to healthy animals is the wording they use. There you go. So that's very, like, to me, just being a pet parent, pretty ambiguous. Like, mm -hmm. what does not being healthy mean? Does it mean allergies? Does it mean, you know, they have a IBD, they have cancer, they have like, what does that mean? And what is it different yeah. in different states? Or is it just up to the veterinarian's um, discretion? I it's, I don't think that label is ever enforced. You know, barring a malpractice case. Um, it, but different veterinarians interpret it different ways. And I've had people say, you know, oh, you know, he's got a hot spot, you know, a big area of skin infection. I'm going to put him on antibiotics, something for the itching. I'm going to dispense a topical surgical cleanser. Oh, sure, he can have his rabies shot or his distemper vaccine now. Now, we know the dog's immune system is churning out white cells to deal with the pus that's oozing from the dog's skin. It's a no-brainer. I would not vaccinate that dog at that time. Um, so many of my colleagues would. Dogs with cancer, autoimmune disease, IBD, that's, a, that's an easy pass on vaccines for me because the vaccines provoke an inflammatory response. We don't want cancer patients, IBD patients, and certainly not autoimmune patients, uh, you know, having their immune system stimulated, having inflammation in the body. Um, one of my other dogs, my first vet school dog, uh, we vaccinated back then in the dark ages twice a year if our dogs were going to dog shows. And believe me, I did everything. Yeah, wow. So it was in the shock that he developed immune-mediated hemolytic anemia and was destroying his own red blood cells. And, you know, two points. Number one, I gave him to that because I was doing what we were told was the standard of care. And you can't feel guilty about doing what, you know, you think is the best at that point in time. Um, and I had a boarded surgeon. We x-rayed him and his spleen was large because it was processing all this. And we thought he had a splenic tumor, so Joe took him to surgery for me um, and opened him up only to be horrified that there was no bleeding splenic tumor, that it was just enlarged. And thanks to his skill, uh, he went on the table with a, a packed cell volume of 28%, and he came off the table at 28%, which you know is probably the main reason he survived that. Um, and through medication, and he was actually my introduction to raw feeding when I switched over. And statistically, he should have been dead in six months. He lived to 13 or so, normal lifespan. He was also epileptic. I got him off phenobarb. You know, it was just the transformative dog that we all get that shows us what's possible when we look at alternative methods. Yeah. But, you know, he was a dog who never got another vaccine in his life. I don't care, you know, rabies or not. Uh, the one th good thing about my profession is they don't require us to kill our patients. And, you know, a repeated vaccine for those immune-mediated dogs could be, could trigger an unrecoverable relapse. Absolutely. So I think all of the, all of this to say, you know, it's wonderful to have all of this information and to keep going and, and learning more so that we can do better for mm -hmm. our pets. 
But if we can kind of go back to, we started talking a little bit earlier about, you know, being able to have these types of conversations with your veterinarian is so important because, you know, I, I was, I probably, when I moved, I probably called oh, I upwards bet. of 50 different right. veterinary clinics, just talking to people, getting a sense of, you know, how, how willing are they, first of all, to even have a discussion with me and mm -hmm. will they accept a titer test to see my animals, you know, all the things before I, well, and, and if I can pause you right there. Yeah. You know, every business is allowed to set their own policies. Mm -hmm. There is no legal mandate that you cannot treat a dog who is not quote unquote up to date on vaccines. But sometimes it's presented to owners in that way. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, if he's not up to date on rabies, my vet will turn him away. Then find a new vet because you should not do that. You know, veterinarians, and again, not legally mandated, but by general practice, we're all vaccinated. My mm -hmm. technical staff is vaccinated. So the day that we had uh, two women show up in our waiting room, it was middle of the day in like January, February, and up here, that's a very gray time of year. It was sleeting. It's miserable out. There's slush on the roads. Two women walk in with a shopping tote. And it's like, okay, you're the only people in the building because morning office hours ended. We're doing lunches and finishing up surgery. And they said, we have this raccoon that we found and he, we think he was hit by a car. It's like, they picked up this raccoon that in the middle of the day was stumbling by the garbage cans at the side of the road because it was trash day. Somehow they did not get bit. They stuffed him in a shopping tote. And I just can envision the one woman who was clutching it, just riding with the raccoon on her lap, rushing it to the vet. It's like, are you dumb as a box of rocks? Leave wildlife alone. And, you know, dumb form of rabies, luckily, because if they had been bitten, I mean, it would have been, you know, picture the raccoons in her lap. And I just, we were all, my one technician was freaking out. What if it gets loose? It'll be in the hospital. And it, it caused quite a panic. And the challenging thing was we called the health department and, you know, they're like, well, did the ladies touch it? And they told me, no, they had wrapped it in a blanket. And the health department did not want it tested. They did not want it to vaccinate the women or anything like that. They're like, just have them wash their hands. It's like, oh, my God, that seems risky. But yeah. goodness crazy. Gracious. And that's how rabies shows up. It's totally out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say. Every animal, as long as they're healthy enough, should have at least one dose in their lifetime. And then you decide if you're going to follow the law or not, because that's on you, not on me. Right. Um, and, and it's going to be, you know, what are the risks in your area? Do you have a lot of rabies? You should go to some areas in the South and it's much more common. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Yes. Um, but it is important, I think, in in. I want to be aware of your time as well. I very much appreciate it. Um, sure. But probably an important, important to end on having, I guess, emphasizing having conversations with your veterinarian and not yeah. 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 and treating them like a human being and expected to be treated back like a human being. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and as you did a little bit of phone screening, even if you're just talking with the receptionist, you know, simple open-ended question, do you offer vaccine titers? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my dog has IBD. Do you see a lot of that or not? You know, you can ask open-ended questions that will get you the information you need about what the philosophy of the practice is. And, you know, like I work part-time in a conventional practice. But I'm allowed to do my thing. And my colleague, Jen, who does acupuncture and Chinese herbs, you know, she does her thing too. So, you know, do you have someone on staff who does alternative treatments like, say, acupuncture, chiropractic, herbs, nutrition? If they have that on board, that's a good indication that you have someone there advocating for titers. Mm -hmm. um, I would say don't waste your time at a corporate practice. 
So if it's a band field of VCA and there's a whole bunch of others, those are very well-known examples. Often their business model does not allow for alternative treatments and you're not going to be happy there. Um, and corporate medicine, unfortunately, is becoming very, very common in veterinary medicine. Um, it sure is. Yeah. It sure is. Well, Dr. Kozier, um, thank you so much for oh, explaining so this. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's simple and it's not simple at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah. if you, um, I always, I always say, let's go back to the very, to the, fa the fundamentals, which is biology, which when you say, think of biology, that tells you what to feed the animal. When you think of basic immunology and following the principles, that tells you how to immunize the animal. Um, and that's, it's, we make it harder. And I would say the availability of vaccines against various things. You know, we have Lyme, we have Lepto, we have Bordetella, we have dog flu. You have to weigh the exposure, the risk, and consider the efficacy of those vaccines and make your best call. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, if you live in, I want to say Arizona, there are no ticks. There's scorpions, but there's no ticks. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. That's I'm interesting. I'm pretty sure it's Arizona. And that that area, but no ticks, so no risk for tick-borne disease. Mm. So why give the dog who lives in a tick-free environment um, a Lyme vaccine? It's not worth it. Yeah, and and also why it's so difficult to give blanket yes no to everything yeah. because you know, there, we, we have different environments and different, if different mm -hmm. animals. And like you said, right. what, you said like 5% roughly, roughly may not even talk. respond. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's wild. And, that's wild. And the other, the other problem with blanket recommendations, like at the beginning, we talked about vets who want to give puppies three distempers, or I had one colleague who wanted to give four. It's like, what's wrong with you? Why are you giving four routinely? Um, our vaccines become more and more effective. You know, these the pharmaceutical companies are always trying to make, make a better mousetrap. So what was appropriate 10 years ago is overkill now because our vaccines are better. Our technology is better. Mm. So you have to keep up with the changes in that regard. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And more reason to, to have, have a good relationship and have these conversations with your veterinarian. Yeah. So you know what yeah. they're doing too, the, like right, right. The American Animal Hospital Association tries with their yearly vaccine protocol. They divide vaccines into core and non-core, and core is basically distemper parvo for a dog and rabies. That they're confident, and I would be too, in saying every dog can derive benefit from being protected against those diseases. Everything else is non-core lifestyle. And an individualized decision needs to be made on those for the dog. Mm -hmm. So many good tips. I'm going to have so many clips to post of this. Thank you so much. Okay. Good, <laughs> good. Well, yeah. and if anybody wants to meet Dr. Lori Larson, you have to come to my event in April. Um, yes. I'm so looking forward to having dinner with her and just talking because you know, she's been with Dr. Schultz from, I, I want to say, even as a graduate student. So she's witnessed all of the evolution of how much we know. And, you know, and for me, as someone who occasionally breeds a litter of puppies, the part, the role she played in developing the nomograph to know when my puppies are safe and when they're not and when they're ready for a vaccine, that's priceless. Absolutely priceless. Yeah, I, I've never, I, I mean, of course, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm a pet parent, but not, have mm -hmm. not even heard of that. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Inc incredible, the technology we have. Without a doubt. we should use. <laughs> we should use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yes, um, definitely check out, that's, is it healthydogworkshop.com? Healthy, healthy Dog Expo. Healthy Dog Expo. Go to the expo site. 
and there's a link on the workshop, but either okay. site you'll get there. Perfect. Yes. Check that out in April. Um, it's a two day event, correct? Yeah. And our VIP program actually is starting Friday afternoon. Uh -huh. So I have, I have 50 VIPs. They get wine and cheese with one of our experts in and ask me anything on Friday. They get an extra session Saturday, an extra session Sunday, breakfast with one of our sponsors on Sunday morning. So, and extra swag and TLC and all, but, um, hands-on herb session with Rita Hogan, which I am standing in on. Rita's cool. like, yeah, I'll teach them how to mix this and take that. And I'm like, okay, as long as they can fly home with it on the plane. <laughs> uh, so I don't want any of my guests being flagged by TSA and who knows what, but yeah, it's going <laughs> very individualized instruction for that, which is really going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rita's amazing. I just um, oh, interviewed her. As well. Oh goodness. So fascinating yeah. what herbs can do. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Well that, yes, please check out, um, I'll have everything in the show notes, healthydogexpo.com for the expo mm -hmm. in April and then, yeah. um, healthy dog workshop for your, uh, recommended vaccine schedule. Um, mm -hmm. that's important to have on hand and also something, you know, you can take into your veterinarian's office to start a conversation with, um, that could also be very helpful. So thank you again, Dr. Kozier. I appreciate you so much. And you are so welcome. yes, thank you for everything you do and for your time today. Sure thing. Let's share this information far and wide. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.